This show is listener supported. You can join us and help our show grow to support more adoptees by going to adoptiesoncom slash partner. You're listening to Adoptees On, the podcast where adoptees discuss the adoption experience. I'm your host, Haley Radke, and this is a special episode in our healing series where I interview therapists who are also adoptees themselves so they know from personal experience what it feels like to be an adoptee. Today, we are talking about food insecurity. We do touch on the topic of intuitive eating in this episode, but we are not referring to losing weight or dieting or any of those types of topics if that is a challenging subject for you. We tried to make this as safe as possible. Okay, with that, let's listen in. I'm so pleased to welcome back to Adoptees On, Janet Nordine. Hi, Janet. Hi, Haley. How are you doing? I'm a level... I don't know. I was going to say I'm a level five, but but that doesn't mean anything. What does that mean? Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah, we're in um, unprecedented times here. We're recording during the COVID crisis of Mm -hmm. 2020. And um, yeah, it's a it's a perplexing time. Yes, we here in Nevada call it stay home for Nevada. That's where I am. That's nice. It is. It is nice. In Alberta, we're supposed to stay home, but there's no cute name. So stay home we for Alberta. We have a Alberta. hashtag. <laughs> Come on. <laughs> it's a hashtag. <laughs> That's perfect. Love a hashtag. Well, during this time, we've had a few um, Zoom calls for the Adoptees on Patreon, and there's been some themes coming up that people are struggling with, some similar things. And one of them is food. And you kind of jumped in right away and we're talking about some things that really I had some light bulb moments about and and we had a couple people say, oh my gosh, you guys have to do a healing series episode about this. And so what you were calling it was food insecurity. Yes. Can you explain what that means? Sure. And I can kind of explain that from a perspective of my own life experience I've been on the show before, so people have heard kind of my story, but the part that I didn't share then was I came to my parents at about seven months old and I was underweight and I couldn't eat off a spoon and the back of my head was flat. I'd been in an adoptive placement prior to them and then in foster care and I had a lot of difficulty just relating to food and being able to be fed. And I've worked on that and thought about that and struggled with that most of my life and Had I been a baby born today in that situation, I would have been probably diagnosed with failure to thrive, which is when a baby can't take in nourishment and has a difficult time with that process of eating. So all of my life, I have worried about food. As a child, I was the kid that hid the food. I never wanted somebody else to have a special treat because that meant I wasn't a specialism. So even into adulthood and even as a therapist, it's something I still work on. Carbs and bread, or that's like, you know, the crack cocaine for me is like, that's the thing that gives me comfort. I grew up in a family where food was a big deal. My grandmother was an amazing cook. Both my parents were amazing cooks. Um, a lot of things rotated around the family dinner time. So food insecurity for me really means, um, is there going to be enough food? When is the next meal? What am I going to eat? I'm planning ahead, always thinking about it. So my insecurity and other children and adults' insecurities wraps around that early childhood, even in utero experience of food. So that's where the term food insecurity comes from. I've heard this from other adoptees, especially those that have been in foster care, multiple placements, orphanages Mm -hmm. for a long time, that food hoarding thing, like sneaking things away and hiding them in your bedroom or Mm -hmm. um, yeah, having like a stockpile somewhere. And and I've seen this really gets me, but I've seen some like adoptive parents who will put a lock on the pantry or the fridge because of that. Is that something that is actually, I don't know, I I wouldn't say it's like super common, but is it? I don't know. In some foster homes, I would say that is super common because the kids will get into food and that's, you know, it becomes a power struggle, doesn't it? And that's what they can control is what they're putting in their mouth and their belly. And then the parent or whomever is the caregiver doesn't want them to eat all the food. 
or have it be gone or not have it be there when they need it. So they'll put a lock on it and then it becomes a shaming issue. You know, like I'm not supposed to have food. Now I'm shamed because of it. So yeah, that does happen. It's not, I wouldn't say it's helpful at all. Mm, Yeah. mm -hmm. And so kids that are, you know, now adults, but that had like a stockpile in their room or Mm -hmm. felt they need to save food just because they don't know when the next meal is coming or they're afraid that there's not going to be another meal coming? There's some of that that happens. Yes. And so I have to hide food because I need to know what's available to me when I need it. You know, I need, I'm the one that needs to know where it is. So if I get hungry, I can go and find my little stash in the closet and I can have my, I can be able to feed myself when I need to. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's a control issue. It's also just a uh, biochemical response to stress. You know, I'm feeling stressed. And when I eat that cookie or that sweet thing, I get that sugar rush and I have that moment of, oh, I feel better because those good brain chemicals got released into my body. I'm not going to say whether or not I grabbed a cookie right before I came down here, but it's <laughs> I did. Um, <laughs> okay. Now, now this in the context of this COVID, you know, people mm-hmm. are under shelter in place or we're watching the videos of the grocery stores with bare shelves, mostly sure. toilet paper empty, but also pantry staples. Um, I can't find is- pasta. There's no pasta. Well, guess what? All you gluten eaters are also buying the gluten-free pasta. So you're welcome for what you have to eat now. Um, <laughs> but it's really, it's highlighting this in us, right? If sure. if we didn't have a, f- if it wasn't obvious to us before that we might have had a little issue with food insecurity, I don't say little to minimize it, but mm-hmm. if it wasn't, you know, top of mind as an adult, this can kind of bring it out, which is what I'm sure. sort of seeing in some of the adoptee groups. It definitely does exacerbate the the problem, you know, like if there's nothing at the store, then there's really nothing. Like, what am I going to do now? Where is that going to come from? I can't trust my community to provide food for me. I can't trust my parents didn't provide food for me. Where is that going to come from? Yeah, it's, it's very scary when you go to the store. And um, here in Las Vegas, there's lots of stores that have lots of empty shelves. It's getting a little bit better now that we're, I think, four, five weeks in. But in the beginning, it, it it reminded me of in the 70s during the bread lines in Russia when you would just see people lined up waiting for the food. That was a, something that just came to mind as I was seeing people lining up and waiting. And yeah. Hmm. I definitely noticed heightened anxiety in myself when mm-hmm. I couldn't find the gluten-free pasta sure. that our family, because especially since I'm celiac, so I can't have gluten or it right. makes me violently ill, uh, you know, whatever. Um, <laughs> it's kind of a big deal. My, and my family can all eat gluten, but I can't. And so that was this extra layer for me of, mm-hmm. oh my gosh, what am I going to eat if I can't find the things that are safe right. for me to eat? And then we, you know, as adoptees, if we've had any of those food insecurities, as little little people, little children, we have that feeling as um, if I don't have food the instant I need it, I will die. That's kind of that intense feeling, you know, that you go through. Mm. Wow. So I, I know that there's lots of people experiencing this heightened anxiety and around food, not just adoptees, mm-hmm. but specifically talking to adoptees who are listening, what are some things that we can kind of learn about ourselves and I don't want to say like work on during this time, but it's calling attention to something in ourselves that Mm -hmm. um, maybe needs addressing. Well, for me, as I began to research and I began to work with a new therapist that does a lot of um, body psychotherapy, it really normalized things for me to know that I'm not the only one. And Little babies that are not adopted, they have some of these same struggles. Other people that are not adopted have some of these same struggles, and adoptees have these same struggles. So for me, getting the information, knowledge is power. You know, when I can learn something about how my body responds and how it's responding perfectly normal for this situation that I'm experiencing right now, I feel like I can work with the situation or the problem or the whatever is being presented and I can, I can heal and I can move forward. So as I've done research, our relationship with food really starts in utero. 
So what I know about my own experience of being in utero since I've met my birth mother is she shared that she was hiding in a trailer for most of her pregnancy with very little food, smoking cigarettes. So when I was born, I was low birth weight, which we know is a contributing factor from smoking. And I didn't get a lot of food in utero. So I started off with that implicit memory, like Dr. Julie Lopez speaks about, of food is life and food I don't have a good relationship already with food. So having that information was was great for me because then I could really go, oh, now I understand what's going on in my body when I feel like I don't have enough food. When the relationship ruptures, any relationship, it creates a lifetime of wondering, like, will I ever have food again? This relationship with food, if it's been, it's had some attachment issues, um, is there enough food? Well, I need to hide the food. When will the food come to me again? So just, you know, just learning about how your body functions and listening to people that are super wise and seeking out guidance and support has been so helpful for me. One thing I will, I'll never forget, I might not have the wording exactly right, but we were, I was talking to one of our mutual friends, Anne Heffron, and Mm -hmm. one of the things she said was, I'm still waiting for my first good meal. And she, she was talking about that in context of you know, she didn't get breastfed after birth. And, Mm -hmm. and, and, and this is not to, to, to shame formula versus nursing or any of those kinds of things, Mm -hmm. but we don't necessarily know what our first meal was in a hospital. And that was one of the things I said on that Zoom call that I was just amazed by the response. I said, who fed us first? I have no idea either. I know I went out one door and my mother, birth mother went out the other door. So I don't know, like if some nun who was a nurse gave me a bottle or if it was propped up or what happened. My brain can create all kinds of scenarios and stories and none of them are great. But yeah, I, I've spoken to Anne about food too. And she's, we talk about like, what are we hungry for? What is, what is that? You know, what are we hungry for? What we're looking for, what that little baby needs is that attachment and that attunement with the person that feeds them. You know, as you're holding that baby and you're making the eye contact and whether you're breastfeeding or using a bottle or however the baby's getting food, it's the eye contact and the attunement and the connection that they need. And then if the person that's doing the feeding, the caregiver is anxious or angry or annoyed at the end of their shift, what's going on, the baby's picking up that they, what babies can do, they don't know they're hungry. They just know that they need some need met, so they cry. So then they come to get fed and the an- anxious caregiver is feeding them. The baby picks up on that eye contact and that energy of the anxiety that the person's feeding. And then they get the clue that, oh, this food means that I'm not really attaching to this person. So then their little body and their little nervous system has other responses because they're not attuning to the caregiver that's giving them the food. So the baby's looking for the attachment, not necessarily the food. That's pretty major. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So when you think about, you know, when you've, when you've been feeding a baby your own or somebody else's, it's that cooing and that's that, oh, what a good little, you know, and all of that, that the baby needs and loves and helps it grow. And if they're with a foster home or a nurse or whomever, you know, maybe that's not happening for them. And I'm not saying foster parents and nurses are not doing that, but maybe not in the way the baby needs. Hmm. Wow. That's fascinating that that, and then of course, these are like our earliest memories that are getting built nonverbal. The baby learns that the food is the comfort, not the attachment. So it's meeting the need. My tummy's full, but I'm not really attaching, but now I feel better because I'm not crying because my tummy's full. So food becomes comfort. And for me, that means cinnamon toast becomes comfort. <laughs> <laughs> the food becomes comfort, not yeah. the attachment. Yes. The signal to the body is the food is satisfying. And it's very confusing because they're not getting the attachment and the attunement, but they're satisfied. So how is this related to just oral stimulation in general? Mm-hmm. Because you know, people have this thing with putting things in their mouths, if it's food or a cigarette or whatever, chewing on your nails or anything like, because mm-hmm. what I've heard, like, I don't, I don't know. I didn't research this, um, but that's a comforting <laughs> thing. And a lot of people are going back to maybe nervous habits that have to do with the mouth in during this time, because it brings some sort of comfort. 
Yes, it's exactly the comfort. It's not necessarily the process of eating or the process of smoking or the process of touching your mouth or, you know, we can't touch our face. We do it all the time. Now I, I notice so many times I touch my face more than ever. But we have in our body, we have two brains. We have a brain in our head and we have a brain in our belly. So what's happening when you're eating or you're using that oral stimulation, your belly brain is saying, oh, I'm getting satisfied. I feel better. Yeah. So it's just, it's just like, mm-hmm. I'm not, things aren't right. Something is off because I'm yes. stuck at home with my children. <laughs> yeah. The, be- <laughs> the belly brain speaks to us about our language of satisfaction and sensation. Like it needs that sensation of eating or that sensation of chewing or all of those things to feel satisfied and feel comfort. It's just an extra way of giving ourselves comfort, but mm-hmm. it's, it's, unconscious right like we yes, kind of just start doing that without deciding to yes hmm. so I have this book that I've been reading and I love it it's called the heart of trauma by Dr. Bonnie Badenock and that'll be one of my recommended resources but she said um, this quote the quality of our relationships both past and present impact our ability to take in nourishment isn't that interesting like our ability to take in nourishment, not that just we need nourishment, but how is our relationship with our caregiver? How is our relationship with food? Do we eat it because we're hungry and we nervous or anxious or bored or whatever the reasons, or do we eat it to really nourish our bodies? What's the purpose of the food that we're putting in our mouths that's going into our stomachs? That is interesting. Wow. Okay. Mm-hmm. So at the beginning, you were kind of sharing that this has impacted your life and and you've shared with me privately that this is something that you are working on. Can you talk mm-hmm. a little bit about that, about your personal journey and sure. what led you to reading this book and, you know, looking more mm-hmm. into this food insecurity idea? Well, on a personal level, I've always wanted to kind of get my eating under control. I'm an overeater and I am seeing a therapist and um, her name is Wendy Dingy and she is an integrative body practitioner, psychotherapy practitioner. And um, amazingly enough, she was someone in Las Vegas that does this type of therapy who's also adopted. So to me, finding this unicorn of somebody I didn't already know and that also has a shared experience has been huge for me. So one thing that I chose this particular therapist because I really wanted to work on body stuff, not just um, food intake, but how I feel in my body. And one thing in our one of our very first sessions as we were talking about, you know, the process of adoption and Um, for me, I started out as a problem, like the person that was carrying me, she couldn't keep me. So that became a problem. I was placed for adoption. So that was another problem. And for a lot of years, I felt like I shouldn't even have a body. Like I couldn't feel my body. Sensation was weird. Like sometimes when I eat, I don't really notice that I'm full. So I'll keep eating. So we talked about that. And she uses a phrase, of course, of course you feel that way. Of course, that's your response. And just the more that I heard the of course, the more I was able to recognize like, oh, I've been doing all these things, of course, because of how I started out in life. What's amazing is the more I accept the of course, the more I'm able to make changes and make some space between the trauma of some of those things and the ability to make change and heal. And I now I'm starting to feel like I deserve to have a body and I deserve to do things. And it's not, I don't have to hide and live small anymore. And it's like really feeling in the sensation of my body. We do a lot of breathing work in our sessions, which has been amazing um, and connecting. And the more I'm able to take in a deep breath, I can feel like my lungs filling and I can feel like the cells in my body moving. So it's really been a life-changing, life-altering experience to do this type of work. And I think as an adopted person, if we don't feel like we deserve or have a body or can do anything with our body, then finding a a therapist or somebody that can do some body work is just an exceptional way of trying to get back and live your full life and like live the life you deserve. Don't we practice so often just ignoring all those cues? Yes. Yes. <laughs> like we're so disconnected mm-hmm. and not just adoptees, but, you know, I think a lot of people are just completely disconnected. Yeah. Well, you don't feel like you should exist at all. Of course, you're going to disconnect from your body because you shouldn't have been here in the first place. Hmm. Of course. Of course. Wow. 
you know, and then that I don't deserve such a theme for adoptees. You know, we don't deserve whatever good comes into our life because, of course, we don't deserve our very first person that brought us into the world couldn't keep us, didn't want us. Of course, we feel that way. And I guess I'm I'm going to say now that, you know, we're having this discussion and it's it's mm-hmm. not to be like let's eat less to go on a diet or something. It's literally not about that whatsoever. For me, it's about noticing. Oh, I notice I'm kind of full. I don't have to finish this huge plate of mashed potatoes on my, on my plate. I just notice it. You know, there's no shame in it whatsoever. There's no, I'm going to go on a keto diet or I'm going to um, take something away from me because that's what my body's had all this time. It's had like, I was taken away. And so, I took away the deserving. So now I'm just noticing, you know, this is the first phase of this change for me. I'm just noticing when I'm full or I'm noticing when I think I need to go eat. What is the emotion I'm having? Generally, it's anxiety um, or boredom. (laughs) Like I don't have anything else to do. Let me go have a bowl of cereal. Hmm. But as I'm noticing those emotions, I can work with them differently. I can do some different exercises. I can take a walk. I can pet my dog. I can um, do some polyvagal exercises that I've learned. And that's so helpful to help me balance things that are happening within my body. I'm not really hungry. I'm just whatever the emotion is. That's rebuilding the connection, right? Is yeah, that, that's, yeah. Wow. Okay. Huh. Yep, neurons that fire together, wire together, you know, and that's relationship with food. <laughs> You're a science nerd. Um, <laughs> I love that you have a little rhyme for that. Can you talk about this a little more about the brain science? Like sure. what's happening when we're eating for, I mean, period, period. What, ha- what mm-hmm. happens when you're eating? Well, I mentioned the belly brain, right? So the belly brain has uh, about 40 trillion neurons, give or take a few. <laughs> <laughs> so there's a chapter in uh, Dr. Badenoch's book called The Belly Brain, and she talks about the neurons and she talks about the science. And I love the way that she explains it. And it's really deep, but then she has little parts in it where she'll stop and say, let's pause for reflection. And I enjoy that. But what happens when we're eating is we're trying to satiate our hunger, of course, but also it's telling our ba- our belly brain ways that we are interacting with our environment. It's telling us about our relationships it's really helped me understand how I function as a human being. Like everything that's happening within our body um, with the stimulus of needing to eat and the response of being full is exactly how it's supposed to happen. So the more I notice, the more I'm able to pay attention, the more I'm learning about how to um, not feel that shame about eating or the shame about overeating. So I'm just noticing those things, like I said. Yeah, and the greater intensity that we listen without judgment our intention is how we can make change and have a healing practice around food. And that's a quote from her book as well. Recently, I listened to a webinar by um, Robin Goebel, who's a social worker that I've done trainings with. And she's a great friend to adoptees. She works with adopting families and children. And um, she recently had a food, how we love food and how food will nourish us. Um, Loving and Feeding a Child with a History of Trauma was the name of the webinar. And I love that she talked about digestion is suppressed in the fight or flight. And this may tell us we are not full or we don't have an appetite. So those of us that have learned to pay attention to um, that trauma response, a fight, flight or freeze, I'm a freezer. It affects our digestion. And when I learned that my freezing, when I'm feeling anxious or my anger level is up and I'm fighting, that my digestion is suppressed and then I don't feel that I'm full, that was a game changer. Like I can think about or I can feel in my body, what is that emotion I'm having? And then my belly brain will kick in and it will be able to say, well, you don't really need to eat right now because it's suppressing your digestion, it's suppressing that need to eat. So it's, everything's all connected, which is amazing. Both our brains are connected. Our bodies are connected. Everything is working exactly how it's supposed to for our situation. And when we can recognize that and give some space for acceptance, we're able to make changes and heal. Hmm. 
you know, the plasticity that I've spoken about on your show before, how we're plastic. Not only is our brain and our head plastic, but our body is too, so it can change and grow. And what's happening in your brain when you're walking through the grocery store and there's the empty shelves that of things that you were hoping mm-hmm. for were actually needed and oh <laughs> well isn't that isn't that disappointment and a little bit of fear too right like we're afraid of our, is what's really happening in our community we don't know you know what's going to happen next so if we're able to calm our nervous system we're able to do some of those like I, i'm going to do this butterfly hug thing where we this is just cross your arms and pat your left hand right hand opposite on your shoulders that's a polyvagal exercise that you can do that's calming it might look weird in the grocery store aisle when you can't find the pasta but you know who cares we're all wearing masks and gloves anyway so we're all looking weird in the first place but that's something I do with my clients we do butterfly hugs and I've no other therapists that do those as well and it's helpful I mean I, I just did that and I feel a little calmer. Hmm. That's, settles that's me. something that my psychologist has recommended for one of my sons when he is anxious before bed. Yep. Um, Cause you can do it to yourself. Sure. Sure. There's lots of little things you can do with your body. The, the whole key is feeling your body where, where in your body are you feeling that? What's your body feel like? Like right now I'm sitting in a chair with a cushion. I can feel the cushion under me. Um, I'm touching my knees. I can feel my knees with my fingers. I can see this wall in front of me. I can see you with your beautiful goldenrod blouse on and, you know, <laughs> just, just naming things and it helps to settle, settle that down. Mm-hmm. Well, that's pretty good info, Janet. What else do we need to know? Well, I was going to share with you a sensory grounding activity that I like to do with kids and adults can do it too, if that's okay. I love it. I'm always your guinea pig. So (laughs) let's go. (laughs) So name, Haley, name five things you can see right now. A mug, a whiteboard, audio foam, my microphone, Kleenex. Okay. Name four things you can hear. My furnace hum, which is very irritating. (laughs) Well, Uh, mostly because it's April and the furnace is on. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, when we're recording. I have a heating pad on as well. Just uh, I can't hear it. But um, I hear my dog breathing because she's sleeping next to me. I can hear the rustling from my headphones touching my head really good awareness yep good what's the fourth thing you can hear maybe my voice when I'm talking to you thank you I'm like I don't hear anything else I'm listening because I'm like are my kids still upstairs Mm -hmm. quiet they're being quiet that's good I can't hear them can you name three things you can touch Uh, my desk my Mm -hmm. laptop my water bottle perfect name two things you can smell that might be a little harder right now. I can smell the foam around my microphone. Mm-hmm. I grabbed my lip gloss. Mm. I can smell what, that. What scent is it? Can you name it? It smells like vanilla. Perfect. And the last thing, number one, the one thing you uh, can taste, maybe you don't taste anything right now, but what's something Uh, you look forward to tasting? A ginger snap. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Gluten free. And that's just a grounding activity. You're using all your senses. You use sight, your hearing, your touch, your smell, your taste. And what that does is it allows your brain to go into its senses and it gets you into your body. So it's a grounding activity you can do when you're feeling stressed or feeling. Okay. So before I came down, I was Mm -hmm. hungry. I grabbed a cookie, sat down. My stomach was kind of unsettled. I always kind of get nervous. Mm -hmm. Even if I'm talking to a friend uh, when I'm recording, I'm like, oh my gosh, please let the technology work. Right. I have all those (laughs) things going on. And when I finish that, like my stomach is like calm and fine like I don't feel like it's upset you know what's interesting about our physical response you just you just explained we can either think it's anxiety or excitement they feel the same so which do you think it was 
Oh, I think it's for me, it's both. Okay. It's both. Yeah. And they're one and the same. You just, you know, the label doesn't matter. It's just you're noticing in your body how you're feeling. You described mm. it perfectly. That's so interesting because we, in adoption, we talk about having this holding the joy and grief at the same time. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in excitement and anxiety at the same time. That's totally true. I love that you said that yeah. for me because I am concerned about tech failure during recording or me screwing up in some way, being so unfocused, I can't ask the right questions or whatever. Yeah. But I am also excited. I'm excited to engage with you. Yeah. And if I can quote my therapist, Wendy, one more time, she says, being human is messy. And I love that. It doesn't matter if you messed up. It doesn't matter if I misquote or if something happens. It's just being human and it's okay. Hmm. That's given me such permission. Just that one phrase has given me permission not to be perfect in everything I do. Because don't we all, as many of us have, as adoptees have that, I have to do it just right. I have to be compliant. I have to do things in a certain way. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 I can mess up now and I don't like shame myself into eating all the toast. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, this is just a human thing. Yeah. Hmm. yeah. And mm. I can be a therapist that works with people and I can have flaws. That's another thing that's amazing that that has given me permission to do. Hmm. I love that. That's such a good thought. And I mean, people have big feelings about food anyway. Well, food, food is amazing. I mean, Anne, again, turned me on to chef's table. I can turn on chef's table and completely on Netflix and completely lose myself in the music and the process of cooking. And that's something I love too. I love to cook and I love to nourish people and I love to make cinnamon rolls and share them with my friends and family because it gives me this great pleasure, but it also really tastes good. Hmm. Yeah. And that's, that's one thing about, um, like my views I've got, I'm in the health at every size camp mm -hmm. and, um, have learned a lot about intuitive eating and those kinds of things, which are nothing to do with losing weight or sure. body shaming or any of those kinds of things. And it's so good to just talk about what those issues are adjacent mm -hmm. <laughs> that some of us yeah. struggle at, with without having coming to it from a shaming sort of lens. Sure. You know, when you can embrace your curves, that's a whole, it's a game changer. Right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that's right. Yeah. Hmm, that's so good. Thank you. Is there anything I didn't ask you about that you want to make sure we get to? I think that one of the things that I wanted to share is nutrition and relational safety. This is from Robin Goebel again. When they were offered together in inf infancy, that's when we know that we're we're okay. Like what we're still doing as grown-ups and as humans is we're seeking safety all the time. And sometimes that safety comes in food. And when we can recognize that we can be safe even without the food, that's really big. We don't have to do the overeating or undereating or punishing ourselves with food, but we can seek safety and we can be okay just as our, just because we know we're safe. Hmm. I think there's something freeing about mm -hmm. knowing that there are these underlying reasons for the way we are, the way we are, and yeah. that there's other people who are thinking about these things the same way, sure. you know, just like you yeah. said at the beginning, I'm not mm -hmm. alone. <laughs> right. Any little baby that would have been taken immediately from their mother to go into the NICU has some of these same struggles, you know, not adopted, they're staying with their family, but they were taken right away and they didn't get that immediate um, nurture that they needed. So it's it's that any little baby phrase that has these experiences is helpful. Thank you so much. I think this was really mm. valuable. Now, you mentioned the book, The Heart of Trauma. Yes, by Bonnie Badenoch, and she's in the Pacific Northwest. And I know she does trainings and consultations and things, but all of her books are just um, amazing. Another one that she's written is called Being a Brain-Wise Therapist. But really, I think anybody that's interested in psychotherapy, that's a good book for them too. And um, the thing I mentioned about intuitive eating, one of my best friends is a dietitian and she mm -hmm. recommends this book, Intuitive Eating, eating by Evan Triboli. And oh boy, <laughs> my, <laughs> my pronunciation, I'm so sorry. You know, it's just, I do my best. Um, Elise Resch, it's, it's really well done 
very informative and helpful. And a lot of the things that um, you were talking about, Janet, about noticing and Mm -hmm. those are sort of like in the first stages of intuitive eating and paying attention to feelings and and those kinds of things. Um, Mm -hmm. There's like, it's very step-by-step process to learn how to get to that point where you are eating in a way that is um, the most helpful for your body. It's more nourishing for yourself. Yeah. So you can have safety. Yeah. And, you know, Haley, I'm not there either. I'm still in the infancy stage of this making change in my life. But what I do know is I want to live long. I want to live as long as I can and I want to be healthy and I want to feel good. So these are the reasons I really want to make changes in the way I my relationship with food is. Mm hmm. Thank you. And thank you for sharing some of your, you know, personal story. I think a lot of people will identify with that. And I think as soon as we think of our early days, it will bring up things for people, you know, and and this is just one of those factors. Yeah. And when you think of like when I think of that little baby Janet, you know, I can send her love and I can support her and I can visualize what I might have looked like and I can provide some of that for her. I have this phrase that I'm using now and just in my brain and my life, like I'm looking for the full Janet-ness that is in me. I'm really trying to find that. And by nurturing that little baby me has been really helpful to be this grown up person that can um, live in all of my, my Janet-ness, you know, and be a full, I don't have to hide anymore. It's awesome. Uh, uh, Once again, I will say, I love that. (laughs) Yeah. So you can live in your full Haley-ness. Full Haley-ness. Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Where can we connect with you online? You can connect with me online with, um, on Facebook, Experience Courage Therapy and Consultation, Janet Nordeen, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist, Registered Play Therapist Supervisor. I'm on Instagram as well, so I just have to look for Experience Courage. And you are taking clients in your own practice now, aren't you? I am. I just opened Smart Me like the week before the quarantine. I opened a private practice. Isn't that awesome? It's great timing. But I know you do things online. Yes. Also in my infinite wisdom, I did keep a part-time clinic job too. So I'm pretty busy in this world of teletherapy. So it's been going well. Well, I, I've shared a couple places, but I am doing my therapy online with my psychologist yeah. because my boys are home and I don't want to take them into the office. Sure. And it's been fine. So Yeah, the greatest thing for me right now is my therapist, Wendy is ding, Dingy, is still seeing there some clients in the office and I get to like make a trek across town and have an adventure and go to therapy once a week. So it's been really good. <laughs> That's so good. Thank you so much, Janet. Okay, confession time. I am struggling. (laughs) Like, gosh. I told my kids to be quiet and they're still making noise upstairs. Like, how do you record with little kids in the house? I don't even know. Anyway, I am struggling to keep to a weekly schedule. And that has been, I already told you a couple weeks ago, that has meant some interviews have been canceled because people are struggling and aren't able to record and not in a good mental space, which I totally respect. And then I am struggling to find quiet times where I can actually have book someone and have that hour of focus. Anyway, so I think what I'm going to do during this time is go to an every other week schedule, which is Not what I wanted to do, but that's sort of where we are now. I don't think I have a choice at this point. So my apologies. I am really doing the best I can. I have some other extenuating circumstances, which I will tell you about um, in a few weeks probably. But yeah, we are um, working on some things here and it's just, it's a whole juggle. So if you are working from home, if you are sheltering in place, if you have little kids with you, if you are by yourself, whatever your circumstance, if you are feeling it like I am, I am sending my good thoughts toward you (laughs) and solidarity. It's a whole thing. And I never expected, none of us did really, to be living this way. And um, I mean, frankly, I'm speaking from a place of privilege because 
I still know that we have groceries and a house and all of those things. And I feel safe where we are. And I feel like there's lots of people that aren't able to say those things. So I understand the privilege I'm coming to. Um, and yet this is still hard. So anyway, I, um, thankful for you for listening. I hope this episode was helpful for you in some way if you deal with food insecurity. And I'm going to be keep putting up new episodes, but like I said, they'll be every other week. And I also have a Patreon podcast that I put up every week. So if you really want to keep the show going and you want to hear me ramble on every week <laughs> for some reason, <laughs> adoptiesoncom slash partner has details of how you can get the Adoptees Off Script podcast. And that is for monthly supporters as a thank you for helping the show continue. And there are instructions on Patreon for how you can have that podcast drop right into your podcast app where you like to listen, just like you would play this show. So it's really simple. And I'm updating Patreon. There's going to be some new things that are happening over there. And one thing we've been doing during this time of sheltering in place or quarantine or what, whatever you're sort of experiencing in this lockdown, I don't know what to call it even, um, is we've been having some Zoom calls with Patreon supporters. And those have been really good and helpful and encouraging to me. So I'm going to continue to do that when I'm able. And so that's another bonus as well. And there's a link for that in Patreon. Um, also, when there's a new Zoom call, I put that in Patreon as well as in the secret Facebook group. So, okay, adoptiesoncom slash partner if you want to support the show. <laughs> and we're going bi-weekly. Why did it take me so long to tell you that? <laughs> anyway, um, sending you love. I hope that you're doing well and that you're keeping healthy and staying safe. Thank you if you are out there working as an essential employee in some fashion. Thank you if you're staying home to keep everyone else healthy. Thanks so much for listening. Let's talk again in two Fridays from now. <laughs>